Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of Exploring History, a podcast where we discuss everything history-related and turn it into stories and tell it to the best that we possibly can through our research. As usual, all of our sources are in the description below. If you'd like to watch this podcast in documentary form, check out the description below and you'll find a link. You can watch it there, and by doing so, you will be greatly supporting my channel so we can put out more videos such as this. Today's topic is why Germany sank the RMS Lusitania. During the years 1914 and 1915, the image most people had of World War I hadn't materialized yet. The battlefields on the Western Front were still fluid, trenches a couple of years off. Total war had not yet become a reality. Most civilians, soldiers, and even generals still believed that in the early onset of the war, a great, smashing victory would bring the conflict to a sudden end. Out to sea came the first foreboding clouds of total war, beginning with Britain's promised blockade of all German ports. This greatly frustrated Germany's ability to wage a continuous war, negatively affecting not just soldiers on the field, but civilians blurring the distinction between the front line and the home front. Blockades were nothing new to war. In the 1860s, America had successfully blockaded the Confederacy during the American Civil War. What was significantly different was the sheer scale of this blockade against Germany. Years of military buildup had finally peaked, and those in charge wanted to see their new toys used. Germany's response to the blockade was to use their U-boats. The U-boat, the new terror of the sea. They knew they couldn't compete with the British Navy on a one-on-one -on -one basis, and their submarines might offer a sneaky alternative. These mechanical monsters had the potential to shift the balance of naval warfare in Germany's favor. This new style of warfare struck terror into the hearts of British civilians and soldiers alike. In reaction to Britain's blockade of Germany, German Admiral Hugo von Pohl, commander of the German High Seas Fleet, declared the following. The waters around Great Britain and Ireland, including the whole of the English Channel, are hereby declared to be a war zone. From February 18th onwards, every enemy merchant vessel encountered in this zone will be destroyed, nor will it always be possible to avert the danger thereby threatened to the crew and passengers. Neutral vessels will also run a risk in the war zone, because in view of the hazards of sea warfare and the British authorization of January 31st of the misuse of neutral flags, it may not always be possible to prevent the attacks on enemy ships from harming neutral ships. Navigation to the north of Shetland in eastern parts of the North Sea and through the zone of at least 30 nautical miles wide along the Dutch coast is not exposed to danger. One such U-boat was the Type SMU-19 model produced in 1913. Only four were built, the U-19, the U-20, the U-21, and the U-22. Its length was 210.5 feet long with a beam of 20 feet and a draught of 11.8 feet. They comprised of 35 personnel. On the surface, they had a top speed of 15.5 knots, and while submerged, that speed was reduced to 9.5 knots. Their maximum depth was cleared to 164 feet below the ocean's surface. They had four 500 mm torpedo tubes, two in the bow and two in the stern. Six torpedo reloads were carried. When surfaced, the U-boats were also armed with a 66 mm deck gun and an 8 mm machine gun. The overall idea was to retaliate against the British for what they were doing to Germany. These U-boats would target any supply ship going to and from the British Isles. Due to the Type U-19's limited range, most of these submarines clung to the British coast. Their total range was 11,200 miles when surfaced and only 92 miles when submerged. Thus, the U-boats stayed relatively close to the British shores. Amidst all this was a young and eager officer of the Imperial German Navy. Captain Lieutenant Walter Schwieger, signing up in 1903, he was one of the first to experience Germany's experimentation with U-boats. He eagerly embraced it. With the outbreak of war in July of 1914, Walter Schwieger was promoted to Captain Lieutenant 
and given a new assignment. December 1914 Captain Lieutenant Walter Schweger assumed command of the U-20, quickly establishing himself as one of the most ruthless and successful U-boat captains in the Imperial German Navy within just a few weeks. He sank the first three ships he encountered heading to Britain, without hesitation and without mercy, and the crew readily obliged. All three were small merchant vessels. Having been captain for only a few months, Schweger earned his reputation. By many accounts, he was ruthless in battle, but as a captain, he was fair, just, and friendly with his crew. Such attitudes were indispensable in many respects while operating on a U-boat, such as the U-20. Camaraderie amongst the crew wasn't just expected, but necessary. These men would spend countless weeks on the ocean, patrolling, stalking, hunting their prey. After sinking his first three ships with the U-20, he and his crew came along their new target. He gave the order to dive, the submarine obeying, lowering itself to periscope depth. Here, Schwieger observed the enemy vessel, noting it was painted white with red crosses, meaning it was a hospital ship carrying sick and wounded soldiers back to Britain. Captain Lieutenant Schwieger didn't hesitate. He ordered a torpedo fired, considering this hospital ship just as much a legitimate target as a merchant or war vessel. The torpedo missed, likely due to a malfunction. This incident propelled the U-20 into notoriety as one of the most infamous U-boats of the war, making headlines across the Entente and Central Powers. Schweger was far from the only German U-boat commander with such ruthless intentions. The targeting of civilian vessels and hospital ships further antagonized neutral countries against Germany. The most notable, and important, of these countries was the United States, a nation the Central Powers were eager to keep neutral, but the Entente wanted on their side. With the rapid advancement of both civilian and military technology, the distinction between both blurred considerably. This quickly made adhering to the Declaration of Paris, signed in 1856 by both Germany and Britain, complicated. A piece of the treaty known as the Cruiser Rules outlined the proper safeguards between civilian and military naval targets. Article 1. No merchant ship transformed into a war vessel can have the rights and obligations attaching to this condition unless it is placed under the direct authority, the immediate control, and the responsibility of the power whose flag it carries. Article 2. Merchant ships transformed into war vessels must bear the distinctive external signs of war vessels of their nationality. Article 3. The officer commanding must be in the service of the state and properly commissioned by the competent authorities. His name must appear in the list of officers of the combatant fleet. Article 4. The crew must be subject to the rules of military discipline. Article 5. Every merchant ship transformed into a war vessel is bound to conform in its operation to the laws and customs of war. Article 6. The belligerent who transforms a merchant ship into a war vessel must, as soon as possible, mention this transformation on the list of vessels belonging to its combatant fleet. Article 7. The provisions of the present convention are only applicable as among the contracting powers and provided the belligerents are all parties to the convention. Since the war began, several German U-boats had boarded and searched suspected civilian merchant vessels only to discover that they were secretly transporting munitions for the war effort. To the Germans, this rendered any vessel caught carrying such munitions as a legitimate target of war. With the advent of both submarine and air warfare, the ability to fine-tune differences between military and civilian targets on both sides was greatly hindered, and it was all but inevitable that civilians be caught more and more in the crossfire. The era of total war had truly begun. U-boat captains could exercise a great deal of freedom while out on duty. One U-boat captain described the prevailing attitude and conditions among the officers and crew. Quote, the submarine commanders had to be given freedom of action as the authorities back home were never in a position to ascertain accurately what military and nautical conditions the submarines would encounter in their field of activities. At 6 a.m. on Friday, April 30, 1915, Svigger briefed his crew on their new assignment. Their general orders read as follows, quote, Large English troop transports expected starting from Liverpool, Bristol Channel, and Dartmouth. 
Get to stations on fastest possible route around Scotland. Hold as long as supplies permit. U-boats to attack transport ships, merchant ships, and warships. The U-20 set sail as directed, and their latest hunt began. May 6, 1915 The U-20 was operating off Ireland's southern coast. The day was extremely foggy and overcast. Early in the morning, the U-20's crew sighted a large steamer, the Candidate. Because of the fog, Captain Lieutenant Schweger had a difficult time deciding if the ship was neutral or not. He fell back on his doctrine of prior engagements. If in doubt, attack. He initiated a surface attack using the 66mm deck gun. He said, quote, there was little danger to our boat as being rammed or fired upon, referring to the terrible fog. The steamer managed to slip away only momentarily, the U-20 skillfully catching up to it. The candidate's crew then began to abandon ship, and Svigar fired a torpedo. He then had the U-20 sail away, leaving the steamer's crew to fend for themselves in the Atlantic. The hunting on May 6th had yet to be completed. They again spotted the thick black smoke of a steamer, and Svigar ordered the ship sunk. The ship's name was obstructed, and it flew no flags. The U-20 fired a torpedo, striking its target, sinking the ship. Later, Captain Svigar discovered the ship was named the Centurion, the sister ship of the Candidate. The U-20 had just sunk two more ships, and Captain Svigar ordered his ship to dive. He began to take inventory. How many torpedoes did he have left, and how much fuel? As Svigar thought, they were low on both. With only three torpedoes left, and the U-20's fuel supplies falling below 40%. It was standard procedure to keep a couple torpedoes for the journey back to port. Here, Svigar made one of the most fateful decisions of the war. He decided the U-20 could use one more torpedo before they abandoned their patrol. And with his decision made, the U-20 remained, hunting along the Irish coast for any and all incoming targets. During this patrol, the U-20 intercept a radio message. They learned the RMS Lusitania was sailing toward their patrol area from New York. The timing could not have been more perfect. Svigar ordered that the U-20 remain on patrol for another 24 hours. At 5 o'clock a.m., Svigar surfaced the U-20 to see a cold and foggy morning. Visibility was extremely limited, just as it had been the day before. By 10 o'clock a.m., the fog had then cleared, revealing a bright and beautiful day, visibility unlimited. It had just turned 1.20 p.m. Watchers observed black plumes of smoke in the far distance, described by Svigar as, quote, a forest of masts and stacks. They must belong to several ships. Then I saw it was a great steamer coming over the horizon. Zvigar then ordered to dive to periscope depth, the crew following his orders. They now did what U-boats were best at, stalking, moving into position, waiting for the perfect time to strike. Captain Lieutenant Zvigar knew that should the U-20 be spotted, the massive steamer could easily outrun her. And he was absolutely correct. At their fastest, the U-20 could only travel up to nine knots while underwater, fifteen knots above. If indeed this was the Lusitania, she was renowned for her high speeds, nearly reaching twenty-seven knots. Zvigar would have known this, thus his crew and he would need to approach with great caution. If the U-20 was spotted and the Lusitania began to run, Zvigar and his crew had no hopes of sinking her. Even if she changed her trajectory, they'd lose their upper hand. They'd have only one chance to sink her. Still submerged at periscope depth, Captain Lieutenant Zvigar surmised that the U-20 would need to get in front of this great mysterious steamer before them and hope to hit her massive steel hull broadside. After obeying Zvigar's orders, the U-20 then settled about 15 miles off Ireland's southern coast. At this juncture, the massive steamer was headed straight for them, and the crew of the U-20 watched with bated breath. They thought they had their next kill ready, 
only to have it dashed when they noticed a steamer veering away from their position, moving closer to the Irish coast. Some crew began to speculate that the U-20 had indeed been spotted, and that this was the steamer taking evasive maneuvers. Whatever the reason, their target would soon be too far away for their last remaining designated torpedo, and they didn't dare expend any more fuel than necessary. Captain Lieutenant Zwieger grew frustrated with this development, angry that his prized kill was slipping out of his fingertips. Quote, when the steamer was two miles away, she changed her course. I had no hope now, even if we hurried at our best speed, of getting near enough to attack her. Defeated, the crew of the U-20 began to stand down, only a few keeping watch, the U-boat still at periscope depth. That was when something miraculous happened, a total change of fate. To Zwieger's shock, the massive steamer had again changed direction this time turning hard to starboard. Zwieger couldn't fathom why the steamer would, in essence, double back and change course so radically. But whatever the reason, the U-20's target was now steaming into the perfect position for the U-20 to kill. I saw the steamer change course again. She was coming directly at us. She could not have steered a more perfect course if she had deliberately tried to give us a dead shot. Zwieger now ordered his last designated torpedo armed, and the aft torpedo tube flooded. The time was now 2.09 p.m., Zwieger waiting, the steamer sailing into the perfect position for a broadside shot, waiting, waiting, the U-20 only having one chance to strike their target. They waited until the steamer was about 700 yards away. Now! Zwieger gave the order to fire, and the hiss of the torpedo speeding away filled the interior of the U-20. A massive plume of air bubbles then rushed to the surface. A white foaming line trailed behind the torpedo, known forebodingly as a dead wake, as it sped toward the steamer at around 30 knots. If the crew of the steamer spotted the torpedo, they had no time to react. The dead wake was about to live up to its reputation. The crew of the U-20 saw an explosion on the massive steamer's starboard side, between the first and second funnel. A colossal water geyser erupted from this point of impact, propelling debris even higher than the ship's funnels. Only ten seconds after impact, the massive steamer began to take on a heavy list to her starboard side, some say as much as 15 degrees. Captain Lieutenant Zwieger described what he saw in his diary. Clear bow shot. Torpedo hits the starboard side right behind the bridge. An unusually strong explosion takes place. The explosion of the torpedo must have been accompanied by a second explosion. Perhaps caused by a boiler or coal or powder, the superstructure right above the point of impact and the bridge were torn asunder. Fire breaks out and smoke envelops the high bridge. The ship stops immediately and heels over to the starboard very quickly, immersing simultaneously at the bow. It looks as if the ship is going to capsize very shortly by the bow. Some witnesses aboard the U-20 describe the U-boat's pilot observing the Lusitania sinking, and that only here did they realize they had just sunk said ship. As noted by historian Diana Preston in her book, Willful Murder, The Sinking of the Lusitania. However, these reports are extremely suspicious. First, the four smokestacks of the Lusitania were unmistakable to most sailors, both German and British alike. Second, the weather had become clear, all traces of fog vanishing. And third, the Lusitania was one of the most iconic ships of its day. The crew of the U-20 had gotten radio confirmation from intercepted British dispatches that the Lusitania was in the vicinity. Captain Lieutenant Zwieger deliberately stayed on patrol for another 24 hours in part because of his hopes of finding the Lusitania. Whether or not this is true will never be known. The truth is forever lost to time. The second explosion witnessed by Zwieger is a subject of great controversy. In the eyes of the Germans, it could have been caused by the Lusitania carrying munitions from America back to the British Isles. Alternatively, 
It could have been caused by the cold Atlantic waters reaching a boiler, resulting in a significant explosion. For propaganda purposes, the Germans would emphasize the first possibility, that the Lusitania had violated the cruiser rules and was carrying war materials from the United States. Svigar described the scene. Great confusion on board. Boats are cleared away and some are lowered into the water. Apparent considerable panic. Several boats, fully laden, are hurriedly lowered bow or stern first, and are swamped at once. Because of the list, fewer boats can be cleared away on the port side. The ship blows off steam. The name Lusitania is visible in gold letters on the bow. They continue to watch the crazy scene unfolding, the Lusitania sinking and listing more and more. Since it seems as if the steamer can only remain afloat for a short while longer, I gave the order to dive to 24 meters and head out to sea. Also, it would have been impossible for me to fire a second torpedo into this crushing crowd of humanity trying to save their lives. Later in life, Vigor would give a more detailed description of the scene he witnessed and the carnage it wrought. The ship was sinking with unbelievable rapidity. There was a terrible panic on her deck. Overcrowded lifeboats dropped into the water. Desperate men ran helplessly up and down the decks. Men and women jumped into the water and tried to swim to empty, overturned lifeboats. It was the most terrible sight I have ever seen. It was impossible for me to give any help. I could have saved only a handful. And then the cruiser that passed us earlier in the day was not very far away. She would shortly appear, I thought. The scene was too horrible to watch, and I gave orders to dive. It seems both Sveger and his crew, at first elated over their hunt, quickly regretted it. Did they truly feel regret for sinking the Lusitania, or was it because of the coming backlash? No one will ever know for sure. With the sinking of the Lusitania, the U-20 made its way back to port to rearm and refuel. It only took the Lusitania 20 minutes to sink. Upon learning of the U-20 sinking the Lusitania, Germany acted with great pride. One newspaper reported, quote, This was a success of moral significance. This refers to the British blockade and Britain's seeming willingness to allow Germany's people to starve. The Germans did not anticipate the public outcry over the sinking, especially from the United States, with anti-German riots breaking out in several cities across the country. Indeed, the sinking of the Lusitania, with many of its passengers being American, drew condemnation from President Woodrow Wilson and brought the United States dangerously close to declaring war on Germany, the exact opposite of what the German government and military wanted. Meanwhile, massive protests against both America and Britain were underway, with rumors abound that the Lusitania was carrying the aforementioned munitions from America to Britain. Some rumors even proclaimed the Lusitania had been carrying Canadian troops, something the United States, Britain, and Canada vehemently denied. Germany's public outcry might compel their government to declare war on the United States. The result was a PR and international relations disaster on almost every front, and foreign attitudes for Germany soured considerably. Captain Lieutenant Zwieger was then ordered to report to Berlin to give his report where he was treated either with a cold shoulder or harshly in response to his actions. It became clear to him that his decision to sink the Lusitania had done more harm for Germany than good. Zwieger had even been told to lie and to play down some of the vessels he sank in order to help smooth over foreign relations. As a result, he harbored bitterness toward the German Admiralty and the government. To him, Germany should publicly claim the Lusitania sinking a great victory, and he thus considered any other stances as being cowardly. Nevertheless, Svigar was able to keep his command of the U-20, and the U-boat was again set out to sea. Then, in November of 1916, over a year after the sinking of the Lusitania, the U-20 reached an anticlimactic end. Because of thick fog, the U-boat accidentally ran aground, off the coast of Denmark. Captain Lieutenant Zwieger and his crew put up a great effort to try to get her afloat, but to no avail. Zwieger made the decision to destroy her, rather than let the U-20 fall into the hands of the enemy. He knew the Entente would take great pride 
and getting their hands on the U-boat that sank the Lusitania. Upon returning to Germany, Zwieger was given command of the U-88, a faster and better armed U-boat compared to the U-20. Despite the reputation he had acquired, in July of 1917, he was awarded the Pour les Marites, the highest honor a German naval officer could get. Evidently, he had succeeded in sinking over 190,000 tons of Allied shipping. Many described Zwieger as having undergone a metamorphosis since the Lusitania affair, describing him as solemn, reflective, and sickly. Some even suggested he garnered a form of shell shock. Just two months after receiving his award, Captain Lieutenant Walter Schwieger was killed in action. The U-88 was sunk by a heavily armed British merchant vessel, the HMS Stonecrop. All hands were lost. However, this is just one of many perspectives on the Lusitania's sinking. The story of Captain Thomas Turner, the Board of Trade's investigation and subsequent hearings, the truth about the Lusitania's cargo, and more, paint a complicated, messy picture. Part propaganda and lies to bolster the war effort, and part horrific foreshadowing to unrestricted submarine warfare, and the progression of World War I into total war. The whole affair was not clear-cut in black and white, instead an ugly, ugly shade of gray. This has been Why Germany Sank the RMS Lusitania. As usual, all of our social media is in the description below. If you would like us, subscribe, follow us, share us around in groups. It would do us a great favor and make sure that more history podcasts and documentaries such as this can continue to be made. As usual, this is your host, Adam Noyes, and thank you very much for listening.